hello everybody uh, welcome to a new mba web webinar mba on air uh, today we have uh, the pleasure to have with us uh, dr george frey and dr janice mohar from denver colorado and from Ljubljana in slovenia the webinar today will be focused on the firefly technology from mighty oak which is a system a platform of 3D guides uh, for the planning uh, and the planification of a surgery to place pedicular screws in the patient in a spine uh, surgery. Uh, Dr. Frey, uh, good afternoon. Uh, pleasure to have you with us. Um, Dr. Frey is a board certified orthopedic surgeon for, for more than 25 years and uh, his surgical practice is more uh, primarily complex spine and also revision surgeries. He is a serial inventor, um, one of the first uh, notable inversion, inventions that he did was the banana shaped cage that he commercialized later on with Medtronic. Um, maybe his better second commercialized invention is the Firefly 3D guides, patient specific guides that uh, we will talk today about, about it. Also with us, Dr. Mohar um, is a board certified orthopedic surgeon for more than eight years. And he does his uh, practice on deformity and degenerative conditions. He's an active member of Eurospine and SRS and uh, is a long time user of and a believer of the patient specific technology, uh, more particularly for thoracic cases. And he has the honor of being the first surgeon to use Firefly in Europe. So uh, I would like to um, introduce to these two doctors, to all the audience, um, say thank you for being with us today. Um, you, can, you can start with your presentations, doctors. Well, th thank you, uh, Salvador. And uh, good evening to uh, Europe from uh, Denver, Colorado. I hope everybody is, uh, staying well and, and that life is gradually returning to normal. Uh, we probably have a ways to go here in the U.S., uh, but uh, uh, certainly we, we, we at Mighty Oak and, and the surgeons in the U.S. Uh, look forward to a time when we can all get together again uh, in big meetings. Uh, but for now, the, uh, this uh, Zoom concept seems to uh, serve uh, pretty well. And so I appreciate your, your interest and attention to uh, what we think is, is a pretty exciting uh, alternative to uh, the traditional or conventional forms of, of navigation. And I wanna thank specifically Dr. Mohar, who has uh, become a wonderful uh, colleague and, and, and mentor to me uh, with his long history of using patient-specific technologies like this. And uh, so I'm, I'm really excited uh, to hear what he has to say in this capacity. For, for my part, you can see, uh, as uh, Salvador mentioned, uh, what my background is, uh, and I've been involved in medical device development now for, for over 20 years, but really I'm a, I'm a deformity surgeon. I'm classically trained in spinal deformity uh, in both pediatrics and adult. Uh, but as most know in the US, we really do separate ourselves out as either a pediatric or adult surgeon. My practice has become predominantly adult deformity and adult revision surgery. Uh, Dr. Mohar, uh, I think, has a, enjoys a, a greater balance and does more pediatrics probably than I do. And so as we talk about cases later, uh, I think we can compare and contrast this technology to those various applications. Uh, but I would, I would dare say patient-specific guides really are optimal for longer segment, complex deformity uh, and revision type surgery, be it in the uh, child or in the adult. And uh, so that's what we're going to talk about today this uh, technology we call Firefly. Uh, to just give those that are unfamiliar with it, this is a very broad overview description of what it is. These are essentially single-use 
3D printed patient specific guides that offer mechanical constrained guidance uh, for a drill and tap mechanism to cannulate uh, pedicles. And they are in essence the iteration, the, the condensation or, or collection, if you will, of a lot of analytics that occur based off of a CT scan. So there is a strong platform of uh, preoperative analytics that plan the trajectories, that predetermine the optimal screw uh, specificity, so length and diameter, that is suitable for that particular pedicle. And uh, in the US, this was FDA cleared uh, in our regulatory process back in 2015. And uh, the technology received its CE marking for Europe in uh, 2017. Uh, the journey, just so those, those again who are unfamiliar, I'm sure you wonder where is this actually being used? How, how prevalent is this? Well, to date, we have over 130 surgeons that have used Firefly. Uh, in the US, that encompasses about 33 states. But around the world, uh, it's been used in, in six uh, major different countries, over 90 hospitals. And probably most importantly is just that about 15,000 and counting pedicle screws have been put in with this particular technology. And this uh, pie chart here just kind of shows you, I think, the, uh, the approval rating, if you will, of the technology. And, and simply put, of surgeons who try this technology, about 75% retain it and use it. In, on an ongoing fashion in their practice in some manner. And so I think this says that uh, it must be uh, an appealing technology in most surgeons' hands if three quarters of them are, are continuing to use them. Here's uh, uh, just a smattering of the institutions here in the United States, this is just US, that are routinely using this technology uh, such entities as uh, Dartmouth and Cleveland Clinic, Stanford, Virginia Mason, Yale. Uh, so we're, uh, we have a good broad perspective uh, of users and institutions. So this tends to be adaptable for that purpose. There's certainly been a growing amount of literature in the peer reviewed literature on this uh, patient, kind of patient specific navigational tool. Uh, and uh, we can give you a bibliography of that for those who are interested. Uh, however, there's also beyond the clinical data, uh, case examples that you can share with your colleagues or with your patients and uh, some, we would call it marketing material. This is information for your hospital administrators or for the lay press if you decide that this is something that your local newspapers uh, or uh, television stations might find interesting as an, an advancement in local uh, health care. We are always willing and have the material to help use that information for uh, getting the word out, if you will, in your local markets, uh, if this uh, suits uh, your purpose. So, Let's talk, let's get back to what is the technology and what are the steps. I alluded to the idea that this is more than just a plastic patient specific tool, that it really begins with a robust process of pre-surgical analysis of the um, patient's anatomic data. That data is in the form of a CT scan. Um, the accuracy of these, and I'll give you greater information on this. This is a kind of an overview slide for you has been validated at 99.7% accurate. Uh, this is using a qualitative accuracy measurement, for instance, like Gertzbein robbins classifications that most of us are familiar with. Uh, we have been able to demonstrate clear reduction in surgical time, reduction in the need for intraoperative radiation. This would be in the form of fluoroscopy. Uh, and the whole process really involves three basic steps. Uh, the first is you need a CT scan. Uh, this is a high-resolution CT that most of us have access to in our hospitals. Uh, 
nothing unique about the scan. There are certain parameters that we request that the scan be done under, but they're conventional parameters. And a surgeon who wants to try this technology should make sure that their team conveys those parameters to their radiology department so that the scan is done properly. And we can we provide that information routinely. That scan then gets uploaded to a uh, private secure uh, uh, server here in the United States. Uh, that data then goes through a process that we call segmentation. So this is taking the raw DICOM data and turning it in, in the digital domain into a truly three-dimensional rendering uh, of that patient's anatomy. And this is a very important distinction between when the uh, Mighty Oak team does their pre-surgical planning process on behalf of the surgeon as compared to what the surgeon may have to do on their own at a workstation for routine image guidance systems like the, uh, the O-arm or robotics systems where the surgeon remains in the DICOM space looking slice by slice. It's not a very exacting way to do pre-surgical planning or to understand the anatomy. Uh, to create a, a segmented, highly accurate three-dimensional model and work off of that in your pre-surgical planning exercise is a critical difference. And I think you'll see here in a moment the benefits that it can offer. So our team does that pre-surgical planning for the surgeon. However, the surgeon, of course, has to approve that plan. So there's a communication process that occurs where that initial cut of a plan goes back to the surgeon. The surgeon reviews it. This is done by email, and it, these are PDF files in essence, so there's simple transfer of information. Uh, the surgeon reviews it. And if they approve of it or have, have suggestions to alter trajectories, uh, uh, entry points, et cetera, you know, the surgeon preferences are built into this pre-surgical plan, they can communicate that to the engineers. The engineers will revise it. And when the plan is approved, then it goes to step three, which is printing the actual guides. Those guides get sent to the point of use, the source of use, uh, the hospital, and then the exercise of using the guides in the operating room is, uh, is a rather straightforward and intuitive process, and we'll talk about that. So this form of disposable navigation that's done on a case-by-case -case basis is fundamentally different from other forms of navigation that are out there, such as image guidance or robotics. And some of this goes well beyond what we as surgeons think about uh, this goes to our hospital administrators and to those that, that frankly pay the bills, that provide the budgets for us to do what we do. So we know that these very complex uh, optical electronic systems are extremely expensive and they have ongoing maintenance expense associated with them. This isn't a one time buy it and use it for the next seven years until it's obsolete. Our hospitals have to pay every year in the US, it's typically about 20% of the purchase price to maintain these systems. So there's ongoing maintenance costs. There's complexity of the system. Size is obviously an issue. You know, in the US, we're, we're lucky and tend to have big operating rooms. But I know in Europe, that's oftentimes not the case. And if we're doing surgeries in an ambulatory surgery center here in the US, these are smaller operating theaters as well, and simply not applicable uh, because these technologies take up so much space, they start running all kinds of infection risks and so on. And then there's obviously scalability, right? This is one machine that can be used in one surgery at one point in time. A disposable technology like patient-specific guides is infinitely scalable, it can be used in multiple ORs um, uh, simultaneously. So for hospitals that do have image guidance or robotics, but have scheduling issues or conflicts where it's being uh, required in multiple ORs simultaneously, this can be an adjunct, patient-specific guides can be an adjunct technology to uh, allow all surgeons in that program to have access to a navigation tool simultaneously. 
So I alluded to this a moment ago, but let me drill into it a little deeper. What is the difference in, in the actual process of navigating with a patient-specific guide versus with the traditional forms of navigation? All the steps are the same. They're just done in a very different environment. With traditional image guidance or robotics, the process of setting the system up, of acquiring the data, doing a, a data spin, if you will, in the operating room, doing your actual planning at a, at, a, at a console, and yes, then finally getting to navigation, all of that has to be done in the operating room in real time. And if there's ever a, uh, a problem or, or a disconnect of some sort, the system doesn't work or, or there's a technical issue, the surgical team immediately has to scramble and they have no ability to adapt when they find in their planning process in real time that they're running into anatomy they didn't expect. Very different with this platform where we are doing a CT scan ahead of time. We are essentially dry running our surgery by going through this pre-surgical analytical process and doing the planning and sharing this between engineer and surgeon such that when anatomic issues are identified before the surgery is ever done, that a workaround or a solution can be uh, put forth for the surgeon, and, and, and the surgeon does this themselves as well, of course. Uh, and so we, we already understand what we're going to get into long before we get into the operating room. And the guide printing and so on, of course, is done ahead of time as well. So what happens the day of surgery is just the navigation. All of that other lead up work has already been done. And so this makes the actual exercise in the operating room very, very efficient. It also ideally is presented in a manner that's efficient for our support team, our, our scrub techs and our, our circulating nurses. So the guides are paired with the predetermined screw sizes and paired in a manner such that uh, the technician can have that proper screw for that proper level loaded and ready to go before the surgeon even asks for it. How do they do that? They do it because they already know ahead of time what screw is going to go into which pedicle. And so there's no waiting for that as what happens in my operating room when I do a freehand technique. Uh, I don't use this technology, by the way, for every surgery. We'll talk about that later. So when I'm doing a freehand technique, as I'm sure Dr. Mohar would agree, our, our team is sitting there and they're waiting. They're going, okay, what screw are we going to use here? And then you call out a screw size and they run in the back and have to start searching for it and loading it up on the driver. And you're sitting there waiting. And you do this 20 times uh, in a longer segment case. So this is in and of itself a, a waste of time. And so the surgical workflow is really improved with this kind of technology. So what does this pre-surgical plan look like? Let's, let's take a look at this. It begins with a, a page that lays out the levels that the surgeon is, is proposing to operate on. Here's a T1, the T10 case. And you can see that all the screw specificities have already been determined. Then level by level, there's a page for each level that lays out a lateral, axial, and, and what I would call a coronal slice view, a bird's eye view down through the pedicle and gives the surgeon a visualization of where that screw trajectory is going to place that screw. For the team, they also have the repeat of information of screw specificity. So these, these um, pre-surgical plans, by the way, in my operating room, we have these on a viewer. They're up electronically on a, on a, on a screen. And so throughout the case, our uh, representation for our screw system uh, that, that rep will be scrolling through as we go from level to level. Um, and if there's specific anatomic issues, for instance, here at T7, an in-out-in trajectory, the engineers at Mighty Oak will, will provide additional imagery to show the surgeon, all right, this is the amount of screw that is going to be uncovered. If you're using a 4.0 diameter screw, which is the smallest that this particular system offered in diameter, you can see how much of that screw is actually in the bone and how much isn't. This is not information you're gonna get from DICOM images, you're just not. So only when you deal with a segmented uh, analytical structure like this, are you going to have this kind of information. 
And so the surgeon can decide, is that adequate or not? And then additionally in the plan, we aggregate this into the entire construct in the lateral view and in the uh, AP view. So much so that when there's additional considerations in this uh, child with a rather severe deformity involving not only the vertebrae, but typically the rib cage as well, the surgeon, uh, we will include the ribs, for instance, and the surgeon can see if there's going to be collision between the screw positioning and the rib cage. This is not information you're going to get from DICOM images, but in our analytics, you can see this when it's called for. So here are other examples of pre-surgical plans. Take a look at this uh, on the lower left, this uh, moderate degree of congenital scoliosis with a hemivertebrae at T12. You can clearly see the T12 hemi and the analysis of what screws might fit. Pretty straightforward. However, through the segmented process, we also realized that, for instance, L3 had a, a remnant pedicle on one side, L5 was missing a pedicle on one side, uh, and T11 in a similar way was missing a pedicle. In my hands, if I was looking just at DICOM images, I would have seen this image in, a, in an axial slice and gone and said to myself, well, the gantry probably isn't quite right. It may have missed the pedicle of L5 on, the, uh, on that side, and I wouldn't have thought a thing of it. And now I go to the operating room and try to freehand this and spend 30 minutes looking for a pedicle that isn't there. So to me, this kind of analytic is hugely helpful. Uh, in the upper right, you see circumstances where, again, we have varying degrees of available anatomy to put a screw into, and the surgeon can decide, is this adequate screw coverage? Is this uh, to make it worthwhile to put a screw in that location or not? And this is why I say we dry run the surgery ahead of time through this pre-surgical planning process, because all of those questions are asked and answered, solutions derived and decided upon before you get in the operating room. So this is an, a critical part of this technology platform. Um, and here again is an example of, of collision with the rib cage, where you could decide, does, is it wise to try to put in a screw at T12 if the ribs are overlapping? Are we going to do a thoracoplasty? Or perhaps might we put a lamina spreader across this area to distract the spine slightly to make room available to actually put the screw in if it's critical that we do this at that level. Existing hardware is another issue we deal with in pre-surgical planning. Remember I said this technology is really helpful in revision surgery. Well, in revisions, oftentimes there's hardware. And so here, for example, you can see vertebral bone screws in place in the anterior column, and we're trying to put in posterior screw fixation, and the surgeon can decide, are they going to use a, uh, a unconventional trajectory, high and outside, for screw placement in order to avoid this vertebral screw? That would be the example you see here in the lateral plane, or would you just go with a short screw as you see here? Other cases where we have screws that were malpositioned. This uh, shadow of a screw from L4, uh, you could see uh, breaches the medial wall of the pedicle, not ideal. So if we're going to re-instrument this spine with the mechanical constraint that these guides offer and the pre-surgical analytics of redirecting that screw, you can do this in a very seamless fashion without a lot of difficulty. Here's another example. This is a Harrington rod uh, fusion that you can see these. Uh, uh, this actually is Harrington Royale. Uh, so you see the Harrington distractive rod on the uh, uh, patient's right side. And on the left side, you see this compressive construct. So the surgeon's question was to us, do I have to remove the hardware before I instrument the spine? Can you select trajectories for me that will essentially avoid the existing hardware. So I don't have to excavate this. We all have done Harrington rod surgeries uh, or, or revised them rather. And we all know that those rods are buried deep in the bone and it can be quite an exercise to, to excavate these. So the surgeon didn't want to go through that process. So this was the question asked. And so here you can see a pre-surgical plan that was uh, uh, derived where the screw placements essentially avoided the existing hardware. And this becomes an end-to-end -end solution. By that, I mean the pre-surgical plan answers the question, can it be done? 
the guides are then designed to avoid the hardware as well. Uh, and so this is the execution phase in the operating room. And then there's also the bone model that I'm going to talk about now quite a bit that also reflects this pre-surgical plan where the, the hardware itself is printed into the bone model. And the guides, of course, are designed, the actual guides, as you see here, are designed to avoid the hardware and avoid the uh, areas uh, that the surgeon wished to avoid. So this goes from pre-surgical plan in the digital domain to actual um, available tools to be used intuitively in the operating room, and one reflects the other. So let's talk about this bone model. This is really critical. I'm sure many of you have had exposure to use of bone models. This really takes it to a new level for several reasons. One, this is autoclavable and can be therefore in the operating room, in the surgeon's hands at the time of surgery. Uh, but these bone models also have the trajectories that were determined by the pre-surgical plan. They have those trajectories built into the bone model. So even if you didn't have your guides, for whatever reason, you can use this bone model and put a small uh, K wire or a Steinman pin or, or, or a, a pedicle uh, probe into the hole and understand by looking at that bone model and comparing that to your anatomy, understand what's my entry point, what's my vector or trajectory vector, and this gives valuable information even if you're essentially doing freehand surgery. So we sometimes will use it for that purpose. But I can back it up even before that and realize that this is an excellent preoperative tool for teaching our patients, especially in the pediatric population. Uh, I can't tell you how many parents, when you show them this bone model of their child, uh, they realize, number one, you've really taken some significant extra steps to understand the unique issues that their child has. And this speaks very loudly, I think, to the surgeon's commitment to that patient and that family to solve their problem, not some generic scoliosis case. So this is a wonderful teaching tool. It's a collaborative tool that the patient and their family can understand. And so when we start talking about very scary, very complex surgeries for a child, and the parents are rightfully very worried about that, these bone models can really bridge the gap in their understanding of why that very scary surgery is necessary for their child. So we use it as a preoperative teaching tool. We use it intraoperatively as a navigation tool. And of course, we use it to confirm the performance of the guides. The actual guides fit on the bone model as well. And in the process, we recommend that the surgeon fit the guide to the bone model first, then fit it to the anatomy of the patient, and sometimes even go back and forth if there's any question of fit so that they're certain that the guide is fitting the way it's intended. There are some very niche specific uses for, for patient specific guides in the US and I think in Europe as well. The S2AI trajectory is becoming very, very popular uh, as compared to traditional iliac bolts. But this is a trajectory that's, that's rather challenging and, and many surgeons either use large amounts of fluoroscopy to try to get the teardrop view that you see here, uh, or they use some form of navigation. And so to bring that technology and its complexity into the operating room strictly for this one application, the S2AI screw or bolt, when everything else is being done perhaps freehand, that's, that's a lot of work, right? So guides can be specifically designed just for that application, just for that aspect of, the, of a bigger surgical agenda, and uh, it, it's very seamless in that regard. And so this has been very well received by surgeons, and it's highly accurate. We use these guides without any intraoperative fluoroscopy whatsoever. So you can place your S2AI iliac bolts essentially with no fluoro. Um, I don't recommend you do that the first time, but by the fifth or sixth time, you probably will. The pre-surgical analytics help in determining when you have dysmorphic uh, pelvic structures, again, this is mostly in kids and children, uh, you oftentimes have to ask, can I even use an S2AI trajectory? And so here you see an example of uh, some pelvic analytics 
where an S2AI trajectory in this uh, blue screw on the patient's uh, right side is reasonable. On the left side, it was apparent due to the abnormal morphology of the SI joint and the orientation of the iliac wing, where this screw was essentially going to just go right down the SI joint. It was not really going to traverse the SI joint. And so a workaround solution was offered to that surgeon for this case, where instead they would use an iliac, a traditional iliac bolt trajectory on one side and an S2AI trajectory on the other. And so again, identify the problem, offer a solution, dry run the surgery, and, and do this before you ever get to the operating room. So you're not having to figure this out in real time during the surgery. And that's what this type of um, sophisticated analytic affords us as surgeons. Um, here again is an example of, of the S2AI guides uh, being used. Uh, I'm going to run a very quick video here. I won't go through the whole thing in the interest of time, but what you see occurring, the question gets asked, do you use power to do this? The answer is to cannulate pedicles. We highly recommend at a minimum, the power is used for that portion of the surgery. So this is a 3.2 millimeter drill bit that is depth indicated. The guide is giving us a trajectory for the S1 trajectory. We just drilled at 3.2. We now use our standard best practice of a pedicle probe down through that hole. Uh, so the surgeon feels that the hole is appropriate and within the, the pedicle, we now put a tap sleeve in and we're now power tapping uh, the, uh, the pedicle at S1. This is being done with the uh, OrthoFix system, which uh, has qualified taps and works very, very well with this technology. So we've now tapped, we recheck our holes and palpate to see that we like them. Now we go to the S2AI. And so here you can see our exposure is really submuscular. We haven't had to do nearly the dissection we might do with a traditional freehand approach. We're able to lift the muscle away with the Cobb elevator. We've now put the drill sleeve in place. And you can see we haven't brought any C-arm into the room. Uh, and we're now drilling uh, to typically 70, 80, 90 millimeters of depth. The final mark, by the way, on these uh, depth indicated drill bit is 90 millimeters. There you see we pop through the SI joint. We keep going all the way to the 90 mark. We're pretty much hubbing down that uh, drill bit. My assistant here is, is putting some uh, uh, flow seal or gel foam down into the hole because if any of you who've uh, used uh, drills to, to cannulate pedicles versus a, a awl, a drill hole bleeds a lot more. Giannis, I don't know if that's been your experience. Uh, when you sort of compare using a drill versus just an awl that compresses the cancellous bone, my experience has been that the drill holes just tend to bleed more. What do you think? Um, yes, uh, welcome from my part to um, your colleagues. Yes, um, it's been my experience also that uh, drill uh, actually uh, makes the bleeding worse. Uh, but I do not use uh, gel foam. I just leave it to bleed. Um, there has been some evidence that gel foam or anything else that you put in the canal that that actually causes uh, small embolizations. And um, it's been, I mean, it's been proven with a transesophageal uh, ultrasound. Uh, so I don't use it, but yeah, I know different practices. Uh, right. No, that very, very true. Uh, I guess the message here simply is that if you drill, the, if you're not used to using a drill and you first drill a hole and you see a lot of bleeding, your first thought is, oh my gosh, I just drilled into a vessel. I must be in the wrong place. Um, that's unlikely to be the case. Uh, it's really just the nature of using power in this particular application. Um, so, this, I think, you can now sort of get a sense. Here's an operating room. Uh, notice a couple of things as compared to traditional navigation. We have no big machinery in the room. Notice the surgeons aren't even wearing lead. 
um, which in a six hour complex spine surgery case, that's wonderful not to have to wear lead. Why? Because we don't even have fluoroscopy in the room as you can see. Notice that our technician here is already loading the screw even though the surgeons are still applying the guide. And notice that our, our representation for the instrumentation system, that's this gentleman here on the right, is working directly with our scrub tech. They've already laid out what screws are going to come next. The bone models on our Mayo stand and readily available for the surgeons. So this is a very clean and intuitive operative environment. It's not this complex, too much going on, too many people, too little space uh, that we tend to experience when we use image guidance or, or certainly robotics. So, where is the, uh, the peer-reviewed literature for patient-specific guides? Well, the, the compendium of that literature is growing on a daily basis. Um, here is just a, a small cross-section of studies that have been done specifically with, with uh, Firefly guides. Uh, we've had a number of SRS podium presentations. The most recent was in 2018 at the annual meeting. Uh, this was a multi-center study out of the U.S that Raj Sethi was uh, out of um, Virginia Mason in Seattle, was the primary uh, author and investigator. But the value of this study was really to look at a very diverse surgical environment and does this technology work well in that diverse environment? And the answer is yes. Here we had seven different centers, senior surgeons, junior surgeons, a very broad cohort of patients, pediatrics, adult, and deformity, over 100 patients, over 1,000 levels instrumented, T1 to the ilium, so broad spectrum of levels, and a complication rate that none of which were implant related, 1.3% overall complication rate, none related to the implant placement. So this, I think, speaks at a minimum to the fact that this technology can work in a lot of different environments. This uh, NAS podium presentation has now since been published uh, this was out of the uh, University of Michigan. This is a meta-analysis, simply looking at over 1,800 articles uh, to see and answer the question, compared to freehand, do patient-specific guides save time? The answer is yes. Do they therefore reduce blood loss? The answer is yes. And are they accurate? This was using a, a qualitative Gertzbein-Robbins type classification regimen. Yes, over 95% accurate in clinical use. So again, shows very clearly that this is applicable and, and actually beneficial in saving time, radiation, et cetera. Uh, I think this was an interesting art uh, comment. This was from the authors of the study out of India uh, where they said that developing these uh, patient-specific drill templates will enable an average surgeon to treat these patients with much ease and safety. Now, I know that the surgeons on this Zoom call are not average surgeons. So you could just imagine that the far above average surgeon that we're talking to right now is going to look at this technology and say, what can this do for me? Can I tackle even more complex uh, uh, surgical challenges? Or can I simply do my given surgeries safer, faster, less blood loss, all the things we talked about. Um, either way, it's a win-win for both the surgical team and I think for the patient. So let's talk a little about, about accuracy and then I'm gonna turn this uh, presentation over to, to Dr. Mohar. This is a single surgeon experience uh, of over a thousand screws. This has not been uh, published in the peer reviewed literature yet, uh, but I think it gives you a sense of in a very rigorous model what the accuracy of this technology is. Why is this a rigorous model? Well, this was done not looking at post-operative x-rays or doing qualitative analysis of is the screw in the pedicle or not. This was actually looking at the preoperative uh, surgical plan, which is a submillimeter accurate plan, and comparing it to a post-operative CT scan. So now we can really go through postoperatively the full segmentation process again to analyze where did the screw actually wind up. And here you see what these numbers are, roughly within one to two degrees of transverse and sagittal angle of actual screw position versus 
um, what was predicted and planned for, and an entry point accuracy of within 1.5 millimeters. So highly accurate, highly specific. Same uh, single surgeon comparison. Uh, this is speaking more to the, uh, the learning curve, which uh, you can see is, is pretty short. It doesn't take 50 cases to the learning curve. Uh, Jonas, I think you'll speak to that of what your learning curve has been with this. Most surgeons tell us that within five or six cases, they have more than covered their learning curve. Many say by the time they've done six levels, they feel like they understand exactly where that guy needs to sit and they have um, uh, the, the confidence level of knowing when the guide is properly positioned. And of course, that's where accuracy can be determined. But here you can simply see that the time per screw steadily decreases. Typically in our operating room, where admittedly we've done over 100 of these now, um, we're averaging just about one minute per screw. That's typically where we are. So certainly comparable and likely quite a bit faster in, in, in my hand when I compare freehand, my freehand speed is roughly about two minutes per screw. Why? Because I still use some fluoroscopy when I work freehand. When I use these guides, I'm down to one minute per screw and not using any fluoroscopy. And that you can see in the fluoro used per screw. This is in a revision, these were only revision surgeries. So you see a lot of fluoroscopy being used in the revision scenario and uh, quite a bit less being used with patient-specific guides. So at that point, I'm gonna uh, jump out and say, you know, I always love this image here, Jonas, because I think we sometimes feel like we're this little guy in the operating room and, and this is the, the surgical challenge we face. So uh, the hope is that we, we level the playing field when we use technologies like this. But, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen at this point and uh, I'd love to pass it over to Dr. Mohar, uh, who uh, is gonna uh, speak a little more about his experience. Yes, so, um... Thank you, Dr. Fry. Excellent presentation. And thank you, uh, Mighty Oak Medical and uh, MBA Surgical Empowerment for uh, inviting me here and uh, letting me present this talk uh, on technology that uh, I think uh, will change the future of our trade. Um, and uh, I really mean it because I've been using it for over seven uh, years. We all know that uh, pedicle screw based construct um, are biomechanically and clinically superior um, um, as opposed to other uh, implants like uh, hooks or wires. And it's my opinion, and I think you'll agree that uh, pedicle screw placement should be a routine, fast, um, and efficient part of the operation, leaving time and energy uh, to do what is important. And I believe that in deformity, um, correction and maneuvers are important. Uh, so ideal pedicle screw placement technique should be accurate and this directly relates to being safe. Uh, it should be time effective, uh, very important cost effective, and it should be, it should have as low radiation uh, dose exposure to the patient and also to the surgical. are not uh, that efficient. So I started using uh, PSGs or patient specific guides out of the necessity seven years ago. I was a young surgeon uh, out of my board certification um, and I was using a free, tech, a free hand technique in scoliosis, thoracic scoliosis uh, cases with a C-arm 
verification and I just was not getting the results I wanted. Um, I rarely went uh, upwards from uh, T8 uh, and when I did go up, um, it took too much time um, and uh, I just wasn't accurate and then I changed the screws to hooks, uh, did the hybrid case, I mean did the hybrid uh, instrumentation and construct and um, the correction rate just was not um, good for me. Um, then um, quite uh, by chance uh, uh, I stumbled upon this technique. Um, our uh, hospital um, outsourced uh, a company that had a correct uh, software program for segmentation and planning. And we also outsourced a 3D printer and started working uh, quite experimentally uh, with this technique, starting first on uh, um, plastic models, then cadavers and finally on patients. Um, and we designed this study uh, on accuracy of thoracic pedicle screw uh, positions. Um, we uh, defined this position by post-operative low-dose CTs, uh, which are standard in uh, the hospital where I work. Um, and we used this um, just in thoracic scoliosis cases and we graded uh, each pedicle screw position uh, by uh, three classifications. And these are uh, the results. This is the respect, retrospective analysis of perspective, uh, of uh, prospectively uh, collected uh, data. Uh, patients um, with thoracic scoliosis. So uh, 39 initial cases. 362 thoracic pedicle screws with a minimal follow-up of over two years and average follow-up of over four years. Uh, and the predominant uh, pathology was idiopathic scoliosis. And uh, already in this experimental uh, setting, uh, only 10 screws out of 362 um, did not have a complete intrapedicular position, um, which gives us an average, an absolute accuracy <clears throat> with this technique of over 97%. And um, remember, this is not a learning curve. This is basically a developmental curve that we uh, had um, developing this uh, technique. Uh, there were no spinal canal encroachments, no pedicle breaches over four millimeters, and of course no uh, dangerous pedicle screws place, hence no primary or secondary revisions, and the majority of screws were placed uh, in middle and lower thoracic spine, um, which is, I think, amazing. And um, now I will talk about why I switched from this experimental model to Firefly technology. Um, Firefly technology is not just a PSG, it's not just a patient-specific guide, as Dr. Fry um, mentioned previously. It's, it's a navigational platform. It's different from other navigational um, techniques uh, because um, it does not use intraoperative imaging. The imaging is done prior to that. And um, the surgeon is actively looking at the wound, looking at the, uh, what he is doing, not just looking uh, to the screen and um, doing something strange with his or her hands. Um, why a platform? Because uh, as you uh, heard before, it is um, a preoperative planning, it is uh, instrumentation, 
it is a bone model, and finally, it is a PSG. Um, so, uh, what is so special about uh, this guide? Uh, it's a lamina based uh, guide, it has a lamina based fitment as opposed to spinous process uh, based fitment as I was used to before and that's really important uh, because um, it is a PSG that can be used in revisions where there are removed uh, uh, posterior elements. Uh, the fixation of this uh, PSG is done with pins so your assistant does not have to hold it. Um, you just put uh, like here, uh, I have a T7 um, guide fit, fitted on a um, level. And here you just put uh, two pins inside and it stays uh, in the same place. So your uh, assistant can do his uh, or her side and you can do yours. So it's simultaneous work. Um, this technique uses a gentle low speed drilling, which uh, to me was scary at first because I was not used to it, but it's actually very easy and uh, very um, accurate. What I like about uh, Firefly the most is that it's an open flat open platform. Um, you don't have to change your screw system that you have in your hospital. It actually works with any screw type you have. And we know that in Europe, there is a company that tries to sell you their own uh, screw um, system together with um, their guides. And I don't think that's just um, appropriate or actually um, correct. <laughs> and in my opinion, um, this technology is perfect for, like I said, complex long segment spine surgery, especially deformities, instrumented revisions, and uh, last but not least, uh, congenital pathology. Um, there's also a regulatory point of view to this. Um, um, Nowadays, PSGs are classified as custom device in EU, but there's a new EU medical device regulations directive coming into effect where PSGs are losing um, their uh, custom status, custom device status, and are being upclassed to class two device. And uh, this uh, is uh, this date uh, should have already happened, but it's extended due to coronavirus crisis to May 26, uh, 2021, so next year, where all PSGs uh, will, be, will have to be fully compliant to this new rule uh, to be sold legally in Europe. And Firefly technology uh, has all the certifications and is C marked as class two device. So legally, um, if you use the, those, this technology in uh, Firefly technology in Europe, you're legally covered. What are my uh, tips and tricks? Um, well, first of all, uh, I urge you to try it. Um, once you try it, you don't want to go back. Um, but do try it uh, on a primary case. Of course, do not start with a revision case. Um, learn the technical, the theoretical part uh, of this uh, technique uh, and always use the necessary steps when uh, preparing a pedicle screw hole. Uh, this can be done uh, by a visitation. Um, so on one-on-one, -on -one, uh, and I was very lucky to have uh, Dr. Fry um, teach me on my first case, uh, but it can also be uh, on a, on, in the form of uh, internet uh, uh, teaching setup, uh, like a web-based onboarding. 
I always use this bone model, obviously, um, not just as a teaching tool for my patients, but also to first try to put uh, the template, the PSG, on a model and then try it uh, directly uh, on, a, on an exposed spine just to confirm the level and how it fits. Um, you have to use um, this gentle uh, rotational movement uh, and then it just uh, fits uh, like a glove. Um, always remove the soft tissue. Be very meticulous with that so uh, the soft tissue does not impinge um, on um, the surfaces. So we get a real tight fitment and the wide release so um, your retractors and uh, your um, wound um, edges do, do not uh, impinge on a PSG. Uh, I always mark uh, a drill bit two centimeters before starting uh, to drill. Uh, I think that's uh, another additional safety feature. Um, and I always use uh, very slow rotations, uh, use a gentle push and pull motion. Um, and uh, that is uh, very easy and very accurate. And you have to make sure, of course, that you have all uh, four walls and the floor of your uh, cannulated pedicle present. Uh, I'll show you two of my examples. This, is, this was the first case I did on my own in December uh, last year. It's uh, a 12 year old female AIS Lanky 3 CN. Uh, she had a preoperative low dose thoracic CT done um, and received a dose of 0 0.5 millisieverts. That's roughly equivalent to five abdominal x-rays, so really not a lot. Um, um, I instrumented seven thoracic levels, 14 pedicle screws from T4 to T10, and on the right side you can see uh, my uh, preoperative surgical plan that I received um, with a readout of uh, pedicle screw dimensions and a really nice reminder that the T4 uh, pedicle screw is going to go in, out, in. And um, the technical team wanted to ask me just if that's okay or should I change? And I agreed and uh, I instrumented all levels bilaterally. And for my first case, I uh, used 50 minutes um, for 14 pedicle screws. I think that's quite fast, um, 3.6 minutes per pedicle screw, um, certainly faster than what I was used to previously. Um, this is a nice picture showing uh, preoperative uh, pedicle screw positions with an actual postoperative uh, CT. And you can see that uh, level by level uh, positions, preoperative, uh, planning and actual positions uh, match completely and uh, x-rays of the correction. Uh, another case, uh, again, Lanky 3 cn uh, female adolescent. Um, the radiation risk was uh, um, preoperatively because of the CT even lower. Uh, here I instrumented uh, nine thoracic levels, so 18 pedicle screws. Uh, I was already faster uh, below three minutes uh, per pedicle screw. So there is a learning curve, but it's very uh, fast, really, really fast one. I'm not as fast as Dr. Fry, but um, I'm very satisfied with my uh, speed. Again, uh, preoperative uh, planning and postoperative uh, CTs and the perfect match. Uh, some corrections. So what are my conclusions? Uh, in my opinion, um, pedic um, 
personalist spinal guides techniques. Uh, this technique is the safest, the fastest, and cost efficient option for placing pedicle screws uh, in complex spine cases, especially thoracic deformities and uh, instrumented revisions. There are some drawbacks. Uh, you have to use a preoperative CT, but uh, using low dose protocols uh, that significantly reduces the patient's exposure to radiation. And also this technology is not uh, suitable at the moment for emergency cases. Uh, planning and delivery time takes roughly three weeks. It can be uh, even less if uh, there is a need. Uh, Mighty Oak will do anything to uh, help you. So that's it from my part. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Jan. That's, that's, uh, it's impressive work uh, that you've done for sure. Uh, Salvador, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. It looks like there's some uh, questions. In the interest of time, uh, I probably won't present some cases unless uh, there's uh, uh, additional interest in time, but let's go straight to questions because we are at the one hour mark. Okay, um, I have some questions that I have received uh, along the presentation. Thanks a lot to both of you. Very interesting, all the presentations. Um, one is about the protocol of the CT scam. Uh, which are the, the main key points of the CT when you order the CT? Um, what is the um, radiation if you compare with uh, an OR or other navigation CT? All right, so that's, that's a great question. Um, the call <clears throat> essentially, most of us would recognize this as what we call a thin slice CT. So a three millimeter slice thickness, for instance, is, is not going to be adequate. Uh, the protocol calls for a 1.25 slice thickness. Most CT scanners in the US, what we call these 64 slice scanners, automatically scan at a one millimeter slice thickness. And uh, oftentimes when it gets sent to the surgeon, it may be a, a compressed file that the slice thickness is two or even three millimeters. I always thought that's what the scanner scanned at. Having now gone through this journey, I realized the scanner almost always scans at one millimeter. The reason why they're sending us scans that are two millimeter or more slice thicknesses is just because of the, the size of the data file that a one millimeter slice thickness doesn't easily fit on a CD disc, which has what, 650 megabytes of capacity? Or if you send it electronically, uh, <clears throat> it's a very large file. So my point simply is that this is a 1.25 1, a 1 slice thickness is readily available uh, with your hospital uh, if you have a, a modern CT scanner. And it's not gonna change their protocol appreciably. That said, there are some other specifics um, to uh, the settings and they, they're not gonna be disruptive to your, to your radiology department. As far as total radiation dose, as uh, Jana has uh, alluded to, uh, we can actually, and this is more about the technology in the x-ray department than it is the technology of Firefly, but uh, for surgeons who's who are sensitive to the patient's exposure to radiation, which we all are, but certainly more in children than in adults, the low dose protocols work extremely well. And this is now a one and done uh, exercise. In other words, you have this data that you can do a lot more with than what you can with a standing scoliosis x-ray. Uh, and the segmentation process enables that. Uh, so certainly in congenital scoliosis, et cetera, where you, you oftentimes don't really know the extent of your anatomic abnormalities. The CT scan is a, a higher utility imaging modality because you can use it for so many other purposes, uh, Firefly being only one of them. Um, so that said, as far as other radiation doses, uh, I think the 
this is something that is really specific to a given institution. Uh, if the, the drive to do a, a, an adult, let's say on the other end of the spectrum, uh, Yanez, uh, typical CT scan for a, a spinal uh, uh, imaging study could be in the five millisieverts range or, or thereabouts, but that's information that's specific for the, uh, for the particular center. Okay. Uh, Yanez, any comment? Mm, no, not really, um, except maybe um, just to say that, I mean, um, there's always going to be uh, um, either uh, doing a CT or doing uh, the operation in an old fashioned way. And I th believe that um, the advantages of this technology far outweigh the risks of one low dose CT, um, at least to me. Yeah, and, and I think the other thing to, to mention here is that since we're not using intraoperative fluoroscopy, you know, we have to look at the total radiation exposure of the patient. Since we're not doing intraoperative fluoroscopy, um, you're saving a lot on, on that end of the equation. And equally important, uh, I think, is that your surgical team isn't getting exposed to the intraoperative fluoroscopy, which, you know, that this is cumulative over time, right? We're all familiar with the, uh, the studies that uh, uh, show, at least by, by the radiation exposure as a, a um, worker, that it, in the US anyway, uh, that within a 10 year period of time, a spine surgeon, this was Harry Shufflebarger's study, it's probably a 10 year old study, but it's very germane here, that within 10 years of practice, that a spine surgeon has achieved their lifetime radiation exposure limits. Um, and all of us practice more than 10 years. So th this is not just about the patient receiving radiation be in their course of care. It's also about the surgical teams and what are their needs, but both are important. That's, that's true. Uh, there is another question for, for uh, Dr. Mohar when he talked about the decortication and the soft tissue. Uh, somebody asked about how to do it, um, the decortication of the soft tissue to fit perfectly the guide because seems very easy in the bone model, but not so easy in the patient. Well, thank you. Uh, that's a good question. Um, well, you know, um, operating on children is di different from uh, operating on adults uh, because uh, you can really, with children, you can uh, achieve superiosteal um, preparation uh, just using carb elevators, uh, then rongeurs um, to remove um, soft tissue. I also use uh, uh, the Bowie, um, the electrical knife. Um, just be meticulous. Use all three um, of these techniques, and um, that will prob that will usually uh, do what you need to do. <laughs> um, and also uh, always um, remove the capsula on the posterior facets. Um, that's really important. Okay. Yeah, Salvador, what I would, what I would say to that, because uh, that's a very common question, is um, you, your exposure doesn't need to be larger than what you would normally do for a posterior, posterior lateral fusion. But as Jonas has said, it, it, it it serves you well to be meticulous. Uh, and a, a, the electrocautery is really the, the best tool to vaporize the facet capsule and vaporize any soft tissue attachments. Um, when you look at a pre-surgical plan, you'll see there's an image that actually shows in a, in a footprint, where does the guide actually dock on the bone surface? I encourage surgeons to look at that image so they understand what areas they should pay special attention to and should clean up uh, in a little more of a meticulous fashion. That helps on the front side 
to kind of know, all right, where can I be a little less, pay a little less attention? Where do I need to pay maximal attention? And that, it, with that, the dissection doesn't really become burdensome. It's what you would typically do for a good fusion uh, preparation. Okay. Uh, there is other questions regarding uh, using the motor. You use always the motor for the drill, the tap, and the screw placement, or yes, for the drill and the taps, and not for the screw? Well, can I answer that? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I use a motor for um, preparing the pedicle screw hole, uh, and then uh, I tap by hand and I place a pedicle screw also by hand. So just hole. What did you use, uh, Dr. Fry? Yeah, you know, th this is really more a question about is someone comfortable with power or not? Um, here's what I would say. These patient-specific guides perform well with the drill to initially cannulate the pedicle. I do not think they perform well at all if a surgeon says, I don't want to use power, and they try to put an awl down through the guide, and there's, the guide is fighting the awl, and, you know, that's really just fundamentally a different technique. If we think of that traditional uh, Roy Kami technique uh, where you're palpating your way and you're bouncing your way down through the pedicle off the inner cortical walls, that's not what this is. This is mechanically constrained, almost like machine guidance in a very exact and straight on trajectory. It is not a, a arcuate palpation down through the pedicle or something like that. So, so a freehand all through these guides does not work well. You have to really use power then to, to at least cannulate the pedicle with the drill. What you do after that, uh, I think is preference of the surgeon. Do you tap manually or do you tap under power? You put in the screw manually or under power. Um, you, uh, Jonas, you asked what I do. I started uh, uh, where, with what you were doing, but once I had a comfort level with the power for all steps in the process, I realized it's just so much easier on my body, um, my wrists, my shoulders, all of this. So I do it all under power now. I drill, tap, and screw. It's all under power. Um, you don't have to do it that way. Okay. There is another about the sterilization mode uh, for the bone model and the guides. I think the question is regarding if to sterilize the bone model and the guides is different to sterilize the instrument set or is the same? It's the same. Uh, and th it's a great question, uh, but the sterilization process, these do not come uh, pre-packed, sterile, for the simple reason that some surgeons want to actually sterilize the guides in the model with the screws. That little tray that you saw um, can uh, allow the guides and the screws to be combined ahead of time uh, and sterilized as a unit. Uh, you don't have to do it that way, but again, this is about versatility in any given operating room environment um, that you can combine it ahead of time or not if you so wish. But the short answer to your question is standard um, uh, autoclave steam sterilization is the uh, FDA and CE validated method for, for sterilizing this technology. Okay. Uh, there is uh, another question about the, 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 um, the machine, the, the engine, about the slow rotation that Dr. Mohar talked about, about how much speed drill you use in the gym if you use the gym. What is a slow rotation? Janes? Well, you just have to basically well, what, do I, it. I think the I think the question is what's the speed, right? Uh, what are your what are your drill settings that you're using um, uh, in your thing? Yeah, well at uh, first I start when you, you first contact the cortical bone. I, I use a little more um, just to penetrate the cortical bone and then I go really, really slowly, as slow as possible. 
uh, and without any force, just just leave it so that the drill grabs uh, the bone, uh, and do not, of course, do not uh, over penetrate. Just use two cent centimeters. That's enough. Um, how how deep you go with the drill and the tap? Is another question. Like I said, uh, twenty millimeters, uh, not more. That's enough because. Uh, Usually the pedicle uh, is just uh, 20 millimeters uh, long and uh, when the screw grabs uh, its hold through the pedicle, it just uh, penetrates by itself to the, uh, to the body of the vertebra. I think, uh, Salvador, I think there's two things to consider with that. Uh, in, in my hands, usually what I'll do is I'm aware of how long the screw is. To say it's a 40 millimeter screw, I'll just drill and tap 10 millimeters short of that. Uh, so I might drill to 30. But um, what Jonas said is what's critical, which is you have, to, you have to really cannulate the entire pedicle and be into the vertebral body, whatever dimension you believe that to be. And yes, it's probably, I agree, it's about 20 millimeters. The one place that can get you in trouble if you drill or tap very short is with these in out in trajectories. Uh, because wh what you realize is that no matter what, you have to cannulate deep enough so that your pathway is into the vertebral body. If you really drill and tap short, what you've basically created is an in out trajectory you haven't gone deep enough to get back in to the vertebral body. So when you're, when you're dealing with very, very small pedicles and, and there's very little lateral wall to the pedicle, or maybe there is no wall, lateral wall in a true in out in, you, you have to be willing to can't penetrate deep enough to be certain you're back into the vertebral body. I've seen surgeons not do that. And then they use their pedicle sound and they go, ah, oh, I'm out lateral. The, the, the guide led me to go out lateral. Well, no, that's not necessarily the case. It's just you didn't go deep enough to go back into the vertebral body in its medial trajectory. Have you seen that, Jonas? Um, yes, I've seen it. And um, this is actually very dangerous uh, because we know that uh, great vessel, vessels um, are um, in uh, contact with... Uh, the body of the vertebrae and they're shifted actually in a deformity um, so that would be a dangerous idea okay and um, we have another question for for dr fry do you know somebody who has changed to firefly although they have navigation in the or oh, oh absolutely in fact i'd say that's the majority of of surgeons um, you know, most surgeons who initially looked at this technology already had experience and access to what we'll call traditional forms of navigation, image guidance, and even robotics. Uh, and oftentimes they looked at this technology for all the reasons we've been discussing. It's far more efficient uh, and, and has a, a much more re robust pre-surgical planning platform to go with. And so we've seen surgeons uh, move away from image guidance and certainly move away from robotics for the simple reason that they, they realize that PSGs do the job better and faster. Uh, to use a robot in a T4 to ilium surgery, I mean, I, I know it, it's done, but you know, it, that is a painful exercise with a robot or even with image guidance. With image guidance, if you're doing T4 to ilium in an adult, you're doing three spins, three data spins. Uh, you're having to upload all those. You're having to move your reference arc and you're not accounting for spinal motion. See, I, I didn't make this perhaps as clear as I, as I should, but I think a surgeon realizes that these guides dock on an individual vertebrae. And it does not matter where that vertebrae is in space. So if you think of traditional navigation where the location of the vertebrae is all based on 
reference to a common point, to a reference arc. Ro robots work that way. Uh, image guidance works that way. That's a source of inaccuracy. And the farther away you get from that reference arc, your accuracy degrades. Or if there's movement of the vertebrae, your accuracy degrades. And we know the spine moves. So this technology is completely, um, has no sensitivity to spinal movement whatsoever. So much so that you can do your anterior surgery first. You can do your pre-surgical plan, take the patient to the operating room, do your A-lifts, turn the patient over. And when you go to do your posterior surgery, the guides are just as accurate, which when you think of the pre-surgical planning process of robotics or image guidance, that's not gonna be the case anymore. So this is a powerful difference uh, with uh, this form of navigation compared to traditional. So lots of surgeons have switched off of those to, to this platform for that very reason. And another question re uh, related to this one is, when do you use the fluoro during the surgery? At the, at the end or never? Can I answer that? Yanis, give your answer. Yeah, uh, then I'll comment. Well, first, um, when I tried this technique um, so many years ago, I was uh, skeptical. And um, I used fluoro until I was convinced uh, that <laughs> it's accurate. And then I did not use it um, intraoperatively uh, during uh, vertical screw placement. I used fluoro in the beginning uh, just to mark my uh, level uh, before uh, I do my incision. And I do use fluoro after the correction of the deformity, or of course you do use it. Um, I also use it um, after I place my pedicle screws just to check, um, but that's like a protocol uh, where I work, so we always combine uh, x-rays with uh, neuromonitoring uh, and that's it. But I do not use it during cannulation and uh, medical screen insertion. Okay. Yeah. Giannis, I think, I think that's, a, that's a great comment. Here's what I tell any new surgeon who's considering this technology. We as surgeons should never, ever blindly trust any technology. Not this one, not robots, not image guidance. We never trust blindly. That, that's, that's a fool's exercise. And so this Firefly is the same. So when you first start on your learning curve, you don't want to change any more variables in your process than you absolutely have to because we, we have a, a method of how we do our surgeries and we do them safely that way. So I would never ever suggest to a surgeon in your first Firefly case, don't use any fluoro, don't even have it in the room. I think that's, that's a big ask and I think it's unnecessarily dangerous. Do what, Jan, what Dr. Mohar said, use fluoro, double and triple check, do all of that to your full satisfaction of safety and do that for the first number of cases until you feel like you don't need it anymore. That's being responsible to our patients. That's good surgery. So I would never suggest otherwise. What, by the time you've done a half dozen cases, I think most surgeons are gonna say, I don't need fluoro anymore. And I'll use it only for my final checks as, as uh, Yanis said, or when I'm doing my inner body work or, or whatever. But you, that's a journey. That's the journey of, of a learning curve, and I think that's appropriate. Now you say learning curve. There is a question about, uh, for Dr. Mohar, about what is your, what do you think is the average learning curve? Uh, yes, well, for a, an experienced surgeon, um, it's uh, yeah, basically just doing a few levels. And I've uh, taught this technique to three of my other uh, colleagues that work in the same institution. And um, after they've done uh, three or four levels, they're as good as I am. So it's, it's incredibly fast. Uh, it's, and it's fast because it's so easy. You know, if you know how to cannulate the pedicle, if you know how to put a screw 
in the ver vertebra. That's it. You just, what, what you need to learn is how to place this on this. And that's it. So <laughs> once you know that uh, your learning curve is finished. Okay. Um, uh, there is a question about if the guides are patient specific. Uh, I think I can, I can answer the question that, yeah, uh, th these, these guides are patient specific guides. So unique guides for the unique patient. So one guide, one patient. Okay. Um, now we have one here, which is the last one um, that has entered, but I think we can do it right now. And say, normally we used to open up a Yan City needle and place a key wire as a guide for our cannulated taps and screws. Is it possible to use that technique together with the patient specific guides? Jonas? Absolutely. Yes. Well, I think that's, and that's, the, I've, I've uh, I've observed you use that technique, exactly that. So I, I think that's, that is certainly very possible. Um, you know, here's what, here's what I would say, not, not to uh, complicate the question, but understand that the mechanical constraint of that drill sleeve that's provided is 3.2 millimeter. It's anticipating a 3.2 millimeter drill bit to go down through there. So if you want to maintain maximal accuracy, uh, you at least have to start your cannulation process with that drill bit. Now, I could easily see a surgeon then running their, their, uh, their guide wire to advance it further into the vertebral body so that it's, uh, you know, the threaded portion of the guide wire is locked into the anterior margin of the vertebral body as is the typical technique so that they can then drill, uh, I'm sorry, tap and screw over that guide wire. Uh, but it's absolutely compatible with uh, some kind of a cannulated system. Okay. Um, uh, we have been talking about complex cases, revision cases. There is uh, one question about if you are thinking on doing for cervical, uh, what cases would you use the guides in the generative? Okay, I want to make sure I understand the question. So, Salvador, are you saying, is there an application in cervical or are you saying lumbar? No, no. One question is, if there is guides for cervical or the Firefly technology um, applied for cervical, and the other is, wh which cases would you use or do you use in the generative, as we are talking all the time about complex cases, revision cases, scoliosis cases? Okay, Jonas, you want me to take that? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Because, uh, um, I have no experience with uh, cervical spine posterior. Um, I do know that for degenerative cases, uh, Firefly is, um, is actually uh, usable uh, for uh, uh, mid, uh, uh, I mean, cortical bone trajectory. So yeah, please do take this answer. Sure, yeah, so, um, the, the answer on cervical is that, uh, yes, that is currently uh, a version of the technology that is with our FDA in the United States. And uh, so we're, that has been tested heavily uh, and we are uh, very excited about that application for the simple reason, again, that traditional forms of navigation, uh, image guidance and robotics, uh, do not work well when the spine is very mobile. And we know the cervical spine is very mobile. And of course the anatomy is very small and very critical. Uh, and so those modalities of, of navigation are poorly suited to the cervical spine. There's not a lot of real estate there, the spine moves. And that's exactly where patient specific guides do a very, very good job since it's one vertebrae, one guide, and it doesn't matter where it is in space. So cervical is a great application. We should be seeing it here in the U.S. very soon. Um, degenerative lumbar, as Jonas said, you absolutely can use it for that. Here's the only caution I would give you, though, is that some surgeons, when they first hear of this technology and they want to try it, they say, oh, I'm going to do an L4, L5 degenerative spondy case. This is the simple garden variety, uh, the most common reason why we instrument a fusion in the lumbar spine. 
But now you're talking about a very short segment fusion and you're talking about a relatively small exposure. And I'm not saying it can't be done, it can, but it's, it's, it's a lot more of a struggle to use patient specific guides when you're talking about a very, very small incision. Um, and so that to me is not the optimal first case. For the degenerative lumbar surgeon, the case they should bring as a first uh, firefly case would ideally be L3 to sacrum or L2 to sacrum where they're doing a few more levels. So the use of the guides I think will become more, more uh, rhythm and more logical to them. And in those cases, they may be considering additional sacropelvic fixation, iliac bolts, that sort of thing. And that's where this technology is, is another order of magnitude more helpful. Um, I mean, most of us say, look, I can put in a lumbar pedicle screw. I don't need navigation for that. And so that might not be the best application, but stay away from the really small incisions as the first case. That's my point, because I think you'll struggle with that. And that's not helpful in the early learning curve. Uh, Salvador, you're... Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't have more questions. So, I mean, uh, you can finish uh, with conclusions and, and then we, we are done. Yanis? Um, well, my conclusions would be um, just um, try the technique um, and see if you like it. Um, I'm certain that you will. Um, and... Um, Hopefully, uh, that will change the way uh, you operate and it will positively have a positive effect on your practice, as it has uh, in the case with my practice. Thanks, so. Salvador. All I want to say is I, I just want to uh, thank everyone who, who took time out of their busy schedules to uh, to share some of our, our enthusiasm and excitement for, for this uh, technology. And uh, I wish everybody health and, and, and wellness and happiness in kind of a crazy time in the world. And uh, I look forward to a time when we can all see one another again at the, at the big meetings and have a glass of wine or a beer or whatever the preference is. Uh, and so in the meantime, stay well. And uh, uh, thanks, for, thanks for watching. Uh... Okay, uh, thanks a lot to both of you. Um, we are very proud to, to come um, have your, your presentations and your knowledge um, um, and explain to all the, the doctors that I think they would like a lot this, this technology and that we can do uh, good work with this product in, in our markets. So thanks a lot. Um, as you say, uh, I hope we can pass through this special situation we are living and that we can sit together around uh, one table in a Congress and, and talk together. Thank you. Thanks Have a lot. Great evening. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks to everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.